Great big welcome to you as we gather together as God's people, yes, still in our respective homes, but we are the church nonetheless. Glad that you are on board with us today. Um, it is, uh, uh, the lesson continues with Jesus calling uh, his disciples, the fishermen, and he tells them that now not only will they fish for fish, for fish but they'll be fishing for people, and uh, they follow him. They leave everything immediately, and they go out to a brand new adventure. Well, we too are called to be those disciples, and God has adventures ahead for us as well. So don't be hesitant to share your love and your light with the people around you. Be those uh, hands and the feet of our Lord in all that you do. Uh, again, glad to have you on board. Uh, at this time, we now turn the service over to our music team as they share their gifts of music. God bless you. begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so to you, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we pause for a few moments of silence and self-examination. And so, most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us of all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, therefore declaring to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Oh, 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Hey friends, so I want to know, have you ever gone fishing before? Or have you seen someone gone fishing? If you went fishing, what did you have with you? Let's see, you probably had your fishing pole, a hook, bait, maybe a fishing net, and you probably were on a boat. Now when we're fishing, what are we fishing for? Cupcakes? Cheeseburgers? Shoes? No, we're fishing for fish. Now today, Jesus is fishing for people in our Bible story. Yes, fishing for people, but it's not what you think. Jesus is fishing to find disciples to follow him and to share the good news. Now Jesus finds a group of fishermen and asks them, follow me, and they do, but they drop everything so they can follow Jesus and share the good news. You can also be a disciple. You also can follow Jesus and share the good news. What I want you to do is to find a piece of paper and I want you to trace your shoe or your foot. And in that, you're going to write things that you can do to share the good news or to show God's love. So I traced my shoe here and I wrote that I can lead with kindness, I can share joy, and I can send extra love to those in need. Doing that can make us a disciple. So think about it. Trace your shoe, trace your foot, write down things that you can do to help share the good news and to be a disciple. Let's pray. God, we ask you to be with us and give us the courage and the strength to drop what we're doing and to follow you. Help us to lead with kindness and courage and help us to each and every day to share your love with everyone. We pray this in your name. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. And everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Here ends the reading. This is Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Here ends the reading. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 31. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who are rejoicing as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. 
Here ends the reading. Our gospel lesson for this third Sunday of Epiphany is from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse 14. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat, and the hired men, and they followed him. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And so grace and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. And so let us pray. Lord, we thank you that as we gather on this day, each in our respective homes, Lord, we are still your church. Oh, Lord, come. Come and fill the hearts and lives of your people. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleased in your sight. And this I pray. Amen. On our gospel lesson for today from Mark, we see the scene where Jesus is walking along the beach. Little waves from the Sea of Galilee slip up on the sand. Jesus looks down on the beach as far as he can. And he sees there in the distance, he sees some fishermen. It's Simon and his brother Andrew. And as he draws closer to them, he hears a loud swearing of Simon. As he walks past where they are, he says to them, Follow me, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of people. It's strange the effects those words had upon them. Maybe they knew who this man was. Perhaps... They were there at the Jordan and had seen John baptizing him. Perhaps they said, why, it's Jesus of Nazareth, the one whom John was talking about. He's calling us to be his disciples. Let's go with him. Mark writes that they immediately left their nets and they followed him. Three of them went a little further down the beach and there they found James and John. Jesus called them to be disciples and they left their father and the servants in the boat and they went with him. We're struck by the fact that among the first things Jesus did was to gather around himself a group of disciples. While he was in the wilderness praying and thinking and planning, he apparently decided that his method would include training a small group who would carry on the work that he was beginning. He came out of that time of seclusion and he announced the theme of his campaign. He said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And then he chose the twelve to be his disciples. Follow me, he said, and I will make you to become fishers of all people. He called them away from fishing nets to open hands. He called them away from the sea to an ocean of hurting people drowning on dry land. Now they would be fishing for people. But why did Jesus call the disciples? Would it have been better not to trust these fishermen with something so important? Why not go to all the major cities, Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, and hold great crusades? Instead, we find Jesus keeping to the back roads, going around to little towns that few had ever heard of, Capernaum, Nazareth, Bethany, side roads, villages, small towns, little people that no one knew, who were not important, who did not matter, who had no power, no pool, no influence. This is where Jesus spent his time, and in the company of the Twelve. And during those three years, he trained the Twelve to become his church. He was the teacher, and they were his students. So this is one of the most important episodes in the ministry of Jesus. For you see that the Master has come, and he calls his disciples. But we need to understand that the work of the Master is not stopped, no siree. For the, mas for the Master's call continues, calling you and calling me to be his disciples today. But what does it mean to follow Jesus? 
We try to make it sound complicated sometimes, but it is really pretty simple. No one could say in a few words what it means to follow Jesus, but we can state it fairly simply. First and foremost, I believe we find a friend, one whose friendship never ends. That's the first thing to remember. But this is what makes Christian faith different from all other religions. I like the way one pastor stated it. He said a Christian essentially is one who throws himself with absolute trust upon a living Lord, and not one who endeavors to obey the commands and follow the example of a dead teacher. You see, all other religions have as their leader a dead teacher. But Christian faith, it has a living Lord. I love to read theology. I value greatly the historic creeds of the church. Correct belief is vital. We need to know what we believe. But more importantly, Christian faith is a relationship. I'm reminded of the story of John Dean. He was one of the Watergate conspirators of long ago. It's a story where he left Washington and he went back to California. He went down to the library one day and he applied for a library card. He had to give a personal reference, and the lady at the desk said, Well, just put down the name of a friend. He said sadly back, I don't even have a friend. If you ever get one, I'll come back. Folks, we all need a friend. Jesus chose the twelve to be his friends. Who were they? They were nobodies. What qualifications did they have? None. How much training and influence and expertise did they possess? Zero. But he said to them, follow me. He took them on to be disciples. Later on, he said to them, no longer do I call you servants. Now I call you my friends. He took a bowl of water and a towel and he got down on his knees in front of them and he washed their feet. And he said to them, my body I give to you, my blood I shed for you. And he promised them that they would have fellowship, the companionship, the friendship of the Spirit to guide them, to comfort them, to strengthen them always. You want to know what it means to follow Jesus? It means we find a friend, one whose friendship never ends. It means that the one who's in charge of this universe, it is he who is our friend. One could say that we have friends in high places, yes? Or as the kids would say, I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> I believe we all have this great need inside to find a friend. Yes. After the Battle of Dunkirk, a general landed with his men at a British port. An officer told the general how his men could find the rest center and offered the general a ride while his men walked. And the general said, thanks, but we've all been through this thick and thin together. I think we'll stick together to the end. The general walked. That's what it means to follow Jesus means to share in his promise in which he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Secondly, we learn that to live is to learn to give. Yes, to follow Jesus is to be a person who has learned that the secret of living is found in giving. That's why the Dead Sea is, is dead. It receives, but it has no way of giving. One end of the Jordan River is the Sea of Galilee, a beautiful lake filled with fish and plant life. It receives and it gives. The other end of the River Jordan is the Dead Sea. It has no outlet. Nothing grows there because the Dead Sea cannot give. Jesus taught and knew a great truth about life. The living is found in giving and the death comes from grasping. And so it was that he said anyone who tries to save his life will lose it. But those who are willing to give their lives for my sake will find it. This great truth is at the core of what it means to follow Jesus. And whether or not we follow Jesus affects everything we do, everything that happens to us. It's not just a religion, so quote unquote, it's choosing life over death. It's been said that all ills can be traced back to one thing, that understanding the following, the meaning of this following phrase that says it's more blessed to give than receive. He said, when we follow Jesus, we learn that to live is to learn to give. And finally, we go where he leads us, and we serve where he needs us. That is important, too, that to follow Jesus means to be going somewhere, that we're following, following him towards something. We go where he leads us, and we serve where he needs us. You see, he called the disciples to go with him, and they did. 
Simon Peter went all the way to Rome. Thomas went all the way to India. Where do you think God needs you? Where do you think God is sending you? Maybe he needs you to simply be that bright and shining light right where you are. Be it with your family or at the workplace for those still working. Maybe offering support for neighbors in need. Maybe just being a friend. Living in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic is definitely a challenge, but it also offers us opportunities. We don't stop being our Lord's disciples because of a pandemic. We ask, we pray, and we seek God's guidance from our Lord as to how we can best serve his, his hands and his feet into a world that is hurting. Yes, none of us doubt that we live in challenging times with the political unrest, economic downturn, widespread unemployment, and of course the pandemic. The needs around us are even greater. Pray, pray and ask God to lead you where you can best serve. Be the people of God that we've been called to be. Be the balm of Gilead that brings calm and peace to a troubled world. Be the one who hung, helps those who hunger and thirst. Be the one who provides for those who are naked. Be the prayer warrior who prays over the land. There is so much that we can do. Let the Spirit be your guide in the days ahead. So as Jesus called his disciples of long ago, may we need heed his call even today. Remember, we serve a living Lord who yearns to fill the hearts and the lives of people everywhere. So don't be hesitant to share the love and the light that dwells within each of you. Would you go where he leads you and serve where he needs you? With all my heart, I pray that it may be so. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Thank you for all the blessings you bestow on us. Thank you for walking with us through all the tumult and trials of life. Help us to manifest your loving spirit in all we are and all we wish to be. Help us to reestablish trusting and healthy relationships in our families, communities, nation, and world. We lift up those who are ill, in poverty, grieving, weak, and weary, especially those who are dear to us at grace. Sustain us in our ministries and guide us to see and do your will until we join with you and all the saints in your everlasting kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we come to that part of the service that we are calling spiritual communion. Communion connects us not only with our Lord, but with all our loved ones, with all with whom we are in communion throughout all of history. That's what we mean by the communion of saints. So spiritual communion is a trust, and it's an awareness, a prayer, and an acceptance that God's love is really present, even when we can only be as present as our screens allow. God's grace can work through and transcend electronic communication. Through our spiritual communion, the reality of Jesus and the Father's love in and through the Holy Spirit is operating and present in our hearts and our minds. And so I invite you to pray this prayer with me. I believe that you are truly present in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Oh Lord, I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of the, your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus. Let me never be separated from you. Oh Lord, may I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. And all God's people said, Amen. So folks, remember that you are in our love and in our prayers. And again, if you need anything, please feel free to email us or call the church office, leave a message, and we will get back to you. And so receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.